Last week, we, we talked about the power of your past and how the, your past can either be your prison or your platform. And, and, and really, this, that, that some things in our past that are still holding us captive, it's still holding us back. It's like our past is, is something that is pulling us away from God or maybe, maybe just not allowing us to experience all that God has from us because of some memories. And what we discovered last week was that, was that really those things in our past, they're not even true. They're, we're held captive by those strongholds. The Bible calls a stronghold our deceptions. They're lies because the way God sees you, he doesn't even see your past anymore. God doesn't even see you for your past. He doesn't see you for your sins. He doesn't see you for your mistakes. You are a brand new creation. God has chosen to forget your sins and not count them against you. The all-powerful, all-knowing God has made a choice and said, I am not going to bring that up anymore. You are made new. So your past needs, in order to shift, shift from your past being a prison to a platform is you need to understand that, that there's power in your past and your, your, your past can be the platform of which you stand and give glory to God from, okay? So just give me some keys to your breakthrough, some keys to experiencing breakthrough in your life. And today, in week number three, is, is another one that is, that is just powerful. I mean, this one today, if you grab hold of the truths I'm going to share um, this can take your walk with Christ to a whole no- another level. It can really take it to another just dimension, a realm of operating in faith with, with God. And this was uh, exciting for me to study on this and to, to teach on this because um, there's not a lot of teaching, honestly, on this, on this topic. So um, the, the topic today is the power of proclamation. The power of proclamation. Now, there is power in your words. There is, the Bible says, Proverbs says that there is life and death is in the tongue. The power to give life and the power to curse or to give death is in, is in the tongue. But beyond that, this, that, that there is a lot of scriptural um, commands even that talk about proclaiming, that God has commanded you to be a proclaimer. Did you know that? Now, I'm gonna, let me just say something up front because I know that everyone has different backgrounds, histories, maybe some experiences. So let me just, let me just call this out, maybe a white elephant in the room. Okay, I'm not, gonna, I'm not teaching today, name it and claim it. Okay, I'm not gonna go there with name it and proclaim it type of stuff. Uh, but, but what I believe, if you can just, I'm gonna ask for you for the next 30 minutes just to go on a journey with me like I often do and, so, and, and, and just say, without putting up walls and without pushing back on me, go on a journey of, of, of just God's word. Let's discover the word of God, what the word of God has to say about the power of your proclamation. And I believe that together with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can rightly divide the word of truth. Amen? Amen. So just give me 30 minutes without pushing back because you kind of, oh, I don't know. I don't like going there. This sounds like, this sounds like something I, I, I've heard or I've seen and I don't know if I even... Just don't go there with me. Don't push back. And let's just look into the word of God about what the word of God has to say about the power of your proclamation. Now, what does it mean to proclaim? And I'm going to get into some scriptures that talk about, you know, proclaiming even some commands to proclaim. But, but let me give you that, like the definition here. In, in the New Testament, when you see the word proclaim, and it is in there quite often, um, when you see the word proclaim, it means this, not in your notes. I got so much content outside of your notes. For you note takers, you're going to enjoy it today. There was just too much. The definition of proclaim is this, to herald, to herald divine truth. That is what it, that, that's what it means. To proclaim, it means to herald, to, to shout, to declare divine truth uh, in proclamation. We embrace the identity of and resources that came to us through Jesus Christ. That's what we're doing in proclamation. We are declaring the word of God. We're declaring divine truth, and we are called to declare the truth of God. Now, now let me, let me kind of, inside of this, a lot of times when you see the, the word proclaim and the commands even to proclaim in the New Testament, a lot of it has to do even with this gospel, that we're to be proclaiming the good news but wrapped up, wrapped up in this good news, wrapped up in the gospel of Jesus Christ is, is something so much more profound and powerful than just your salvation. I want you to, I want you to know that. And that, that salvation and the payment of our sins is the very essence at the core of the good news. It's at the core of the gospel. But so much more than that, that that wrapped up in this good news is that the kingdom of God is now 
here. That's the proclamation, like the promises of God, the Messiah, the one we have been waiting for, the promise that God would make his abode with us, that he would not longer dwell in temples and buildings, but that he would live inside of you is here. That's the proclamation that through the payment of your sins, that the debt is paid, that you have been made a vessel clean and holy for the inhabitation of the God of the universe. Proclaim divine truth. That's what's wrapped into this. And I think that for a lot of us, in the gospel for us has been a salvation gospel, one that has paid our debts. And we haven't stepped into these realities that there is so much power, there is so much, there is so much available to us through the kingdom of heaven that now lives within you. Okay, and I know, I know I, today I am going to go a little bit deeper than normal because this uh, I just am, and I hope you just, just go with me in this journey of maybe in an area of, uh, uh, just ex- that can take you to, a, to an experience with Christ that is just so powerful, so beautiful. If you grab hold of some of these truths of the power of proclamation to, to declare divine truth. Let me show it to you in Matthew chapter 10, verse 27. And I would just ask you a question before reading this. What in your like daily journey, what voices are speaking into your encounters? What voices are speaking into your challenges? What voices are you listening to? And what voices are speaking into the circumstances, speaking into your need, speaking into the difficulties? What voices are you listening to? And what, what voices are you declaring? Is it the divine truth? Or is it something else? Mark chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus, at this point, he's actually sending out the 72. You guys remember that? Where, where Jesus had, had just kind of walked with the disciples, ate with it, just shared and taught, and he modeled for them. And then he said, you know, go out and do what I did. Now, go, this is what he says, Matthew 10, 27. He told them, what I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered? In your ear, the revelation that I gave you, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, proclaim, declare those divine truths from the rooftops. Jesus said, what you saw me doing, I was healing the sick. I was, I was proclaiming freedom. I was setting captives free. I was, I was you know, dead were being raised. I was, I, what, what you saw me doing, what you heard me saying, you go do that. And then check it out. Jesus was like, and that ain't even the half it. Another spot here in John, John says that Jesus said, even greater things you will do than I were doing because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Like, you're not just going to do this. You're not just going to proclaim this, but it's going to be even a greater impartation of God's power through your what? Proclamation. So even in another spot, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. This is the power of proclamation. And I hope today that, that you will just kind of see this as a key ingredient of your breakthrough, that your response in the middle of your need, it positions you for, for breakthrough. And some of you, the way you're responding, you're proclaiming the wrong things. You're, you're, not, you're not proclaiming the divine truth in the middle of your circumstance. You're, you are proclaiming in the voices that are speaking into your need, the voices that are speaking into your challenge is not the divine truth. And we're not only called to proclaim, you know, the identity and the resources of Christ for us, but we're, we're called to proclaim on the rooftops. We're called to proclaim to the nations, to the people. We're, we're called to proclaim divine truth, not just over our lives, But we're commanded to speak divine truth in the middle of darkness, in the middle of despair, for other people's freedom. Amen? Let me show you that in Isaiah chapter 61. One of the clearest kind of proclamation scriptures that we are to to be used in proclamation is Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 4. He says this, the prophet says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. How many of you got the Spirit of God on you? Anyone in here got the Spirit of God on you? I'll even go a step further. This is the Old Testament. He said the Spirit of the Lord is on me. He didn't say that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is in me, okay? See, there's a, we're living in a whole different era of fulfillment. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord ain't just on you. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is in you. Now, what happens? What, because of that, what? There's a response to that. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim, to declare divine truths, the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. I want you to recognize something here. The reason, the reason why there is a proclamation of freedom is because that something is, someone is being held captive. Okay, there's, there's, that is not the reality. The reality in this situation is there is captivity, that there is darkness, that there is someone who's in bondage. But he is saying, what the prophet is saying, when you proclaim, you're speaking into the captivity, freedom. You're speaking into the darkness, light. I'm speaking divine truth in the middle of, of, of what does not look like divine truth. It doesn't look like the current reality, but I'm speaking, I'm declaring the freedom of God in the middle of your bondage, in the middle of your despair. Do you see that? And he says, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the favor of God on our lives, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. This is our proclamation. And then he says something really cool was that, that, that our proclamation, that the people we are proclaiming to, that we're speaking life into, that they actually have a benefit of this. Look what it says next. It says they, that's the people who received the proclamation, who received the divine truth. They will be called oaks of righteousness. Man, those people that are in captivity, the people that were in despair, the people that are in bondage, he says they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew, they will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. How many of you want to see our city renewed? How many of you see the restoration of our city, of our communities, of our families? This is the power of proclamation that in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the despair and the dysfunction and the bondage, that we speak life. We declare divine truth in the middle of that. And there is power in that proclamation to see it come to fruition. So here's, here's the point of the message today. Write it down this way. That I must learn to proclaim God's truth, divine truth, in the face of life's challenges. I must learn to proclaim God's truth in the middle of life's challenges. And that is very difficult to do. There are some real barriers for us to operate in this spirit. And that is sometimes that what we see and what we feel tell us something different than God's truth, doesn't it? Like what I'm seeing, <laughs> the, what I'm seeing and even how I'm feeling, God, this does not look like your truth, what I read in your word, let me say it this way. We can easily interpret the challenges of our life in the natural mind, what we see, what we see and feel through them as a more sure reality than what God says to be true. Let me give you an important principle. This is an important life principle, one important here for the, the power of proclamation. That the natural mind, the, when, you're, when you're just kind of operating in your natural mind, will we'll always operate from life to death. That's the natural mind. That's, that's the way the natural mind thinks. That's the operation of the, of, the, of the nature of man, the natural mind, from life to death. You live, you die. That's just, there's a season for everything. It just happens, and then, and then there's, there's death. That's the natural mind. It's always progressing towards death. But the spirit mind uh, is always operating from death to life. See, the, the, the spirit mind brings, bring, brings life from dead things. It says that the spirit that is in you is the same spirit that did what? That raised Christ from the dead. See, the, the spirit of God, the spiritual mind is always doing three things. It's always resurrecting, redeeming, and reconciling. That's, that's, the, that's the function, the operation. When you are walking in the spirit and when you have your mind set on the spiritual things, you, you, will, you will always be moving from death to life in every, in every sphere. Your marriage will always be moving from death to life when you're walking in the spirit. Your finances, your relationships, your, your health, it'll always be moving from death to life as you are walking in the Spirit. It'll bring life from dead things, bringing ashes uh, to, from beauty, or, or beauty from ashes, from mourning to joy, from despair to praise, from freedom, uh, uh, freedom to captives. This is, this is the operation 
of the Spirit. It moves from death to life. And it's almost weird. It's, it's, all, it's very difficult to operate this way. To interpret life like not in the reality, to not in what we see and not in what we feel. Because um, this is, a lot of times, God's divine truth cannot be seen in our reality. And it takes faith to see God. It takes faith to please God. And so there are some natural barriers that we have to get over and overcome when, uh, to, to overcome operating in the natural, which so many of us, it's just, it's just a natural thing to do. It really is. That's why it's called natural. It's your natural state to see things and interpret things naturally that way instead of through the divine truth of God's, of God's word. And so to illustrate this kind of natural progression and operate in the natural, I want to I wanna show you the story of Abraham and Sarah. And, and this is a beautiful, perfect picture of, of going from natural, from, you know, from life to death, because um, that's where Abraham and Sarah were. They were, on, they, were, they were on the back nine of their life, right? They were already old. Oh, they were in their 90s, 100s. They were moving from life to death. And, and God gave them, but there was the promise of God. There was divine truth that came into their circumstance that says, no, you will have children in your old age. No, you're going to have an heir. Even at 100 years old, you're, you're going to have an heir. So, so here through this story, we're going to see how operating the natural moves us from life to death and the barriers that we're going to overcome because it is kind of, it's difficult. It's almost weird, really, to, for Abraham to call himself Abraham. You know, Abraham means the father of many. That's what it means. It's weird for, for Abraham now just to assume the title, I'm the father of many, when he's got no kids. It seems kind of weird. It seems, it seems difficult for, for us. And, 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 I'm, and it, let's be honest, it does seem weird. It, it, I don't know if I'm going to be super spiritual, a weirdo, a freak. If I start declaring things that are not as though they were, and I don't know if that's for me. No, it is. If you want to see breakthrough, then you need to start, you need to start proclaiming divine truth in the middle of your death in the middle of your despair, in the middle of the bondage, that divine truth needs to be your reality. Faith needs to be your reality. Okay, so, so even like with Gideon, Gideon the, it's weird for Gideon to be called mighty warrior when he is the weakest in his family. Like Gideon, like, ah, me, what are you talking about? Like, like I mean, they make fun of me. All my, my family members make fun of me. I hate going to the parties because they always dog me out and stuff. And I, who, me? The, my, I'm not a mighty warrior. It feels weird. It's like it's not the current reality for David to be called king of Israel when the actual king is trying to kill him and hunt him down. So how, like, like really, am I the, the, the king? It's almost weird to operate. It goes against your natural state of mind to operate by divine truth, to operate by the spirit instead of by the natural interpretations of life. Are you guys with me today? Okay, okay, operating the natural. Here's, here's kind of the barriers, really, that we see from Abraham and, and Sarah. Here's one of them. And really, the natural really says it's only logical. That's, that natural operates right there where it's only logical, can only see what we fit in our mind, what we can comprehend, what we can understand. Now, don't get me wrong here, you guys. I don't, I don't want you to think that, that just because, you know, you're a Christian or you become a Christian that you have to become illogical, Okay. It's a pet peeve of mine that sometimes people, you know, they think that when you become a Christian, you have to dump your brains out. And that's not true at all. I actually think there's a lot of logic and reason to your faith. There is. There's a lot of reasons to believe, and there's a lot of logic to it. But can I, can I tell you that, that God will operate, often he will operate outside the parameters of your logic. God will often operate outside the parameters of your understanding in a, to, to places where you go, uh, that doesn't make sense. Like, like, like I, that just does not compute, God. I don't understand that. And this is where Abraham and Sarah were picking up in Genesis chapter 16. After they had already received the promises, it says, now Sarai, and that's her name before God changed it, and Abram, Abram's wife, that's Abraham's name before God changed their name. Now, Sarai and Abram's wife had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, she comes out with a plan. The Lord has kept me from having children. Now, I want you to notice that, that not only, not only did she know the divine truth, the promise that God gave her, but because she didn't believe 
in that truth and take and believe in the promise, there's always a progression here. It doesn't stay there. If you don't believe in the promise of God, you will end up being be, blaming God for, for circumstances that he didn't even create. Oh, he, he kept me. He not only isn't going to fulfill his promise, but he has kept me from having children. So I got an idea, Abram. It's a good idea. I think you're going to like it. Why don't you go sleep with my slave? Perhaps I can build a family through her. And Abraham did not object. I mean, I would have got, I mean, so we, someone would've, I would have got in trouble if I didn't at least say, honey, I don't know. I, I, I love you, baby. But Abraham's like, that's a good idea. That's a good, honey, I, I think that's, a, that's, let's try that out. You know, Abraham <laughs> agreed with Sarai and said, he slept with Hagar and she conceived. Because logic tells us that if Abram's going to have an heir, it ain't coming through Sarah. No way. Sarah's barren. Sarah's, Sarah's, you know, so here Sarah knows this, and this, given the circumstances, she formulates a plan, which often we do in the middle of our need, in the middle of our challenges of life. And instead of, instead of falling back, relying on God's word and speaking divine truth in the middle of that challenge and declaring the word of God in it, we formulate a plan. I know, I know what I'm going to do. I know we can fix this. We can do this. We can, instead of declaring the truth, we take it, take matters. And this is because why? Because I don't get it, God. Because it's only logical. It's only, it's only logical. And when faced with challenging circumstances, we, ad, we adhere to the natural and we believe the logical. That's the operating, the operation of the natural. It's only logical. Here's the second thing. Write it down this way. It's only honest. It's only, it's only honest, man. I'm just being honest. I'm just telling it like it is, right? This is, just, this is just the reality. This is the current reality. I'm just telling it how it is. I'm being real, okay? What's wrong with that? It's just I'm interpreting the events as, okay, look, it, it, Genesis chapter 17 now in the story, it says that God said to Abraham regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah because I'm going to bless her, and I will surely give you a son by her. Abraham fell face down, and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man, check this out, a hundred years old. They lived a lot longer back then. Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? She was at the age. I mean, right? I, I, that, I'm just telling it how it is, God, because that's our go-to when we see stuff that seems impossible. We say, oh, I'm a realist. I'm just, I'm just, being, I'm just being real. Do you know that it's, it, you can be honest and not tell the truth at the same time? You can. You can be honestly wrong. Because, no, this is, because being honest has to do with, with, um, uh, with presenting the facts that you've been given with the information you have. But here's the problem. You don't have all the information. You don't have all the truth. You don't know the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. You don't know it, Okay. And listen, and when you do, it, when, you, the, when you do know the truth, you're going to find out that the only absolute truth is God's truth. That's the only absolute truth is God's truth. We're just being real with the facts that we know. I'm calling it, uh, I'm calling it how I see it. I'm just telling it like it is. And some of us put more faith in, our, in the facts more than we do God. But faith, and, and you say, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, a fact is a fact. How can I not? Let me, let me tell you. That, that faith, the Bible says that faith is the, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, right? So, so faith has substance and evidence, although it doesn't start with substance and evidence. It starts as something unseen. What does that mean? It means that facts are always the product of faith. Facts are always the product of of faith. When you put your faith in Jesus, the one who will bring death to life, ashes to beauty, he can change facts into fulfillment. Okay? It's only being honest. I mean, I'm only being honest. You can be honest and wrong because you don't have all the facts. You're interpreting your life through the natural, through what you see as facts instead of the divine truth of God's word. All right, here's the third thing that the kind of a barrier of operating in the natural, and that is, uh, put it, write it down this way, it's only possible I mean, that's all the natural can really believe. It's only, only what's, 
possible. Genesis 18, it says where the angel of the Lord is now in a conversation with Abram. And he says, where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abram replied. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out, and my Lord, my husband, is an old man, will I now have this pleasure? Pleasure. Here is Sarah now just now laughing. It's not possible. Sarah's looking in the mirror, and she's seeing what everybody else sees. An old woman. She's seen, you know, uh, her skin sagging, her bones brittle. It isn't, it isn't possible for me to have a child. She even says, how can a worn out woman like me do that? See, and, and some of you are looking into the mirror and you're interpreting the results in the natural and you're saying, how can a worn, how can a worn out, how can, I'll, I'll never overcome this. This is, this is, I will, I will never beat this. This is who I am. Look at your, and you're looking into the mirror in the natural and you're declaring not divine truth. You're declaring the natural and the natural will always produce death. That's not possible, but can I tell you that we need to stop handcuffing ourselves to the realm of the natural when we serve a God who operates in the supernatural it's time we start proclaiming God's supernatural truth in the face of our natural circumstances. This is the power of your proclamation when you start declaring divine truth in the middle of darkness. Eventually, Abraham figures this out. And we actually get the New Testament now in Romans chapter 4. And, and it tells us now Abraham, the, the full story of Abraham really fulfilling and walking this out. Look at this. The writer of Romans says in chapter 4 verse 16, it says, therefore, the promises of God comes by what? The promises of God come by, say it again, the promises of God come by, okay, the, you, this is what they're saying, in order to receive the promises of God, you got to believe. Let me say it the other way, the promises of God will not be in operation in your life if you don't believe it. The promises of God will not be an operation in your life if you don't have faith to proclaim it, if you don't have faith to believe it. The promise of God is only to those who have faith, who believe, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offsprings, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives, check this out, the God who gives life to the dead. That's the operation of God. That is the operation of the Spirit, to give life, to bring out of the dead things life. And check this out. I love this. He says, to bring life from the, from the dead and cause into being things that were not. Things that are not even there. It doesn't, it's interpreted in the natural. It's not there. But our God calls things into existence from those things that are not, it says. Against all hope, I love this. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. So against all hope, like everything was, it was a hopeless situation. It was like, like maybe you feel in some situations today, it's a little hopeless. Like there's like, you feel hopeless. The Bible says against all that, against all the, the, the facts, against all, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed God. So, so the reality of his circumstances and challenges didn't prevent him from obeying God. It didn't. So you, you want to know why he, he kind of received the promises and received the fulfillment of God? It wasn't because he was, he had this tremendous belief and always believed, we just read how he kind of, him and his wife both doubted God. That's not, look, you're human. They're gonna, you're going to come up against circumstances that you go, that's not possible, God. I don't get it, God. But the reason why he walked in the fulfillment of the promise was because not only did he go, I don't understand, God, but he stepped out in obedience anyway. 
Okay, God, I don't get it. I just, like, I don't get it, but I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight, and it scares me, but I'm against all hope. In hope, I'm going to believe, and so he became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, and he said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening his faith, he faced the fact. So I'm not telling you to be blind to your circumstances. I'm not, gonna, I'm not telling you to go act, just fake it, act like everything's going you know, okay when it's not okay. That's not what I'm saying. Abraham, it says that he faced the facts that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and his wife's womb was collecting dust. I just am interpreting it this way. Verse 20, but he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised to do. So how do we do this? What do we need to proclaim God's truth? How do we do that? We need to take some face steps today. Let me give you four face steps to begin to operate. You want to see breakthrough in your life? You need to start proclaiming divine truth in the middle of your despair, proclaiming divine truth in the middle of your captivity bondage, in the middle of your, your mourning. You need to proclaim divine truth. Let me, let me give you some steps on how to get there. Faith steps. Here's number one, and this one is, is so profound. Okay, here it is, number one. You want some face steps to proclamation? Here's number one, grow your faith. I know that's profound, huh? Yeah, that's a face step. Grow your faith. Because let's be, let's be honest, the reason why we respond to the challenges and the circumstances of life the way we do, the reason why we respond in the natural and we get stressed out and frustrated and, and give up and, and things like that, the reason why we respond that way in the natural is simple, because our faith isn't strong because your spirit man is weak, because your spirit man is a little anemic. So, so you want to take some face steps to get to this level, to see beyond the natural and proclaim divine truth? Grow your faith. Okay, here's the good news, though. The good news is you can. It might be weak right now. Your faith might be weak, but you can grow your faith. You can actually develop your faith. And here's some more good news. Faith will always produce more faith. When you, when you operate by faith, it will always It will always fuel more faith because what I say, faith always has substance and evidence. And as you operate by faith and you step out in obedience and God comes through and you say, wow, God, I didn't get it, but look what you've done. It promotes you to even have more faith the next time God says step out again. So faith always produces, you can grow your faith. Let me give you some hows. Here's Romans chapter 10, one of the key ways to grow your faith. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. Christ. You want to grow your faith? Get into the Word of God. Read your Word. Get it every day. Read it. Listen to it. Re-listen to our messages on our podcasts. Take those notes we give you. Open them up during the week. Watch the videos. Listen to other podcasts. Whatever. If, if our faith is being built by hearing the, the Word of God and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we need to be hearing that every day. If you haven't downloaded the Discovery Church app, download that. That has all of our podcasts, has our videos. Some of you don't know, but that actually has the the sermon notes, the message notes on the app. You can take the notes right there, send them to yourself. Get it inside you. Grow your faith by hearing and reading the Word of God. You want to see breakthrough? You want to see divine truth in the middle of, of the darkness and difficulty, but see beyond that in your spirit? then you need to get into God's word. Here's another way you can grow your faith. That is getting into a group. Get into a group, man. Because if you, if you take the word of God, you can study it all you want, but if you don't transfer that into your relationships and your life, then all you're growing in is knowledge. All you're growing in is intellectual knowledge. That's it. You might be growing in knowledge, but you're not growing in faith. Do you know your faith is tested most in your relationships? That's where your faith is says 90 something, I would venture to say like 95.4% of you, if you have a problem, a trial, a difficulty, a challenge today, that 95.4% of you, it's because of a relationship challenge. It's because of a relationship. It's, it's, it's because of some relationship. That's where your faith is tested most, and that's where we need to grow. Get into a group. This Friday, we have group link. For those of you that don't know about uh, kind of the rhythm of life here at Discovery, we do everything through small groups. We do everything through relationships. We love to gather large like this, but this ain't really the church. This is just us. This is just the celebration. The church is in the homes. 
It's in those groups where you have life on life, sharpening of each other. So we have this, the rhythm of discovery. We start and stop groups three times a year, three seasons. We're starting the groups up again here coming up in a couple of weeks. And this Friday, you can um, see the groups that we're launching for season three at Group Link. It's going to be in here. We have all of our leaders in here with all, with all their curriculum and their study material. You can come in. It's just a social environment. We have some snacks. You can just meet other people, meet the leaders, and sign up for a group. You want to grow your faith. You want to see breakthrough and, and walk in this dimension of proclaiming divine truth and the power of proclamation. Grow your faith. Get into the Word of God and get into a group. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing we need to do, the faith steps to proclamation, and that is pray the Word of God. Pray the Word of God. You see, that's what we're proclaiming. Listen, you can't proclaim your truth okay? That's not, that's, that's not, that's not going to work, okay? You are to proclaim what proclamation and where there's power is that it is divine truth. It is the word of God that we are proclaiming. You can't, God is not your genie that you can just say and proclaim whatever you want. No, 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 no. You need to proclaim the word of God. And there are thousands of, of scriptures and promises for you to proclaim over your life. In one point, Moses actually told God, <laughs> God told Moses, I am tired of these people. I'm just going to kill them all. I'm going to wipe them all out. You remember that? God told Moses, I'm going to wipe them all out. And you guys, you guys are terrible, stiff-necked people. I'm going to start over with someone else who will appreciate me. And Moses, Moses tells God, he starts to proclaim God's word back to him. And he says, God, but your promises, God, was for the seed of Abraham. Your promise, God. It was, and, and he says, okay, you got me. All right. Well, I'm not going to do it then. All right, Moses. So um, this is the power of your proclamation. Uh, when it comes to praying the word of God, there's no greater model than Jesus himself. In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus was led out into the wilderness, um, he was fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, and it was at the end of his fast, when he was at his you know, weakest, that the devil comes to tempt him. And I'm telling you, that's, that's, that's what the enemy will do. At the end of the fast, it's like... There was not this many pizza commercials before I started fasting, you know? And my kids, my kids, they see them like, they're like, that's the fourth one, Dad. Order Domino's already. I'm hungry. I'm like, no, that's the devil in that TV. It's the devil in Domino's. No, it's just, you know, it's just, that's when the enemy comes at your weakest moment. And here's what happened with Jesus. The tempter came at that weak moment of Jesus and he said, if you are the son of God, then tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, what did he say? Say it with me. It is written. That's the response to the challenge. That's the response to the enemy over your life. That's the response when you are being oppressed. It is written. You pray the word of God. This isn't in your notes, but you may want to write this down somewhere. I have it up here on the screen. And that is stop telling it like it is and start proclaiming it like it is written. All right, you need to stop telling it like it is. Stop interpreting life like it is. And you start proclaiming it like it is written. There are so many scriptures, promises within the word of God that you, you can, you should, you are commanded to proclaim and release that power into your life, into your family, into your church, into your community to see change and transformation. I was looking at one of them, an example in Psalm 23. I just looked at that, and I said, you know what? I'm going to give you guys an example. In Psalm 23, beautiful, uh, beautiful illustration of what we can proclaim to God. Here's what I got, I just, just as a way of illustration to you guys. Psalm 23, because God, here's my proclamation, because God is my shepherd, I lack no good thing. Even before my needs are known, my, my good shepherd has made a way for provision to be supplied to me. Not only are my needs met, I have enough for myself and all those around me. I will fear no evil because his perfect love casts out all fear. God provides a place of rest for me no matter the circumstance surrounding me. You can turn the word of God into your proclamation. All right. You want, okay, here are the faith steps to proclamation. Grow your faith. Start praying the word. The divine truth is the word of God. And here's number three. Speak through the spirit. Speak through the Spirit. The, the, the Bible says the promises of God come through faith. Uh, when you speak, through, you can be sure that, listen, if the inner man of the Spirit is silent, then the outer man, that natural man, will be heard. Let me say that again. Some of you didn't get that. 
to speak through the Spirit. If, if you're a spirit man, if, if that regenerated... See, you have two natures. You have, a, you have the, a carnal nature, the natural man, and then you have a spirit man. And if your spirit man is not speaking, is not declaring, is not in a communion with God, constantly open with God, then if he's silent, your carnal nature will be speaking. It'll fill the vacuum. See, the reason why you respond the way you do is because you're not allowing the spirit inside of you to speak to your circumstances. And when your spirit is not speaking, your natural mind will fill the void. And anytime the natural mind speaks, he speaks death. Anytime the spirit speaks, it speaks life. Romans chapter 8, verse 5, 6, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. See, the inner man of the spirit, your new man, where you are a new creation, only lives in the presence of God. The only voice that the spirit man hears is the voice of God. The the mind of the spirit lives in the life of Jesus. The kingdom of heaven is now within us in our reborn state, and we are learning to live from the inside out instead of the outside in. We're learning how to walk in the spirit, how to commune with God in our spirit instead of interpreting life through the natural senses, through what we can see and how we feel, but we're learning how to abide. Jesus says, abide in me and I will abide in you and you will ask for anything and it shall be done. Abide, live in, walk in, speak Commune with God through your spirit. Because when you are not communing with God in your spirit, the natural man takes over and speaks death. The better way to live is to allow the spirit man to always be in control, to live in the presence of God. Speak through the spirit. I'm telling you, if you guys can grab hold of some of these teachings today, it'll take your walk with Jesus to a whole new level. If you, if you start to grow your faith, read the word for yourself. Get into a group, have some, get, get some people with you and do life together. If you start praying the word of God, don't just read it for to fill your mind with more knowledge, but you start, you start taking that divine truth and make it invade your life circumstances. Start declaring divine truth into your life. If you start speaking through your spirit instead of always just through your natural, always, oh, see, when you speak through the natural, you, you're open, you're vulnerable now to stress and anxiety and worry and torment because you're, it's filling the void. The natural will always bring death to your circumstances. It can't bring life. There's no life in the natural. It always goes from life to death. We need to learn how to speak to the Spirit. And then here's number four. The last thing is we need to believe it's done. That's the, the final step in proclamation that what you are declaring, what you are speaking to believe it is done. You see, the promises of God come by faith. Do you know that God, God does not promise to to move because of of the cry of unbelief. God does not respond to the cry of unbelief. And most of our cries, most of our cries are the cry of, oh my goodness, I need your help, God. Oh, and and it's, it's, it's a cry of unbelief. I looked through the whole scriptures. God has never responded to a cry of unbelief. He has always responded to the cry of faith. The promises of God come by faith. See, when you, when, you, when you call out, when you pray the word, when you start speaking from your spirit, you need to actually believe what the preacher's saying. Believe what you're reading because your belief now will form action. It will form a response. That's why, that's why James says, like, he says, your faith will produce something. Real faith produces action. You need to believe that it's done. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 I want to read this one to you because there was the first scripture we read, Isaiah 61. Jesus actually picked up that scripture and read Isaiah 61 in the New Testament. He just reads that scripture. And I want to read that to you guys because he says something very important you need to understand. Jesus, it says that the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, Isaiah 61. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the, of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, listen to this, this is important. He said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. See, today, this scripture, you are living in the fulfillment of the promises of of God. You are living in the fulfillment of the proclamation of freedom, in the proclamation of joy, in the proclamation of redemption and restoration. You are living in the fulfillment of God. So when I proclaim divine truth, I can believe it's already done because it is done. It's been accomplished. Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. It's finished. Here's another, I have so much notes and I couldn't fit it all in. Here's one last one. Once we started proclaiming it like it is written, we need to start believing it like it is finished. You want want to learn to operate in the power of proclamation. Once you started believing it like it is written, we need to start believing it like it is finished. It's done. Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Jesus says, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer... Believe that you have received it. Like, like, like let your faith take you outside of your current circumstance. Don't, don't let the, your current reality affect your belief. Let your believe like it's already done, like you've already received it. And then the promise is yours. And then it will be given to you if you believe that it's already done. Grow your faith. Pray the word, speak through the spirit, and you believe it's done. I promise you, you're going to see divine truth invade your life in the middle of your challenges. You're going to see that. So do me a favor. Let's all stand up. This is, this is an intentional part of the service. It's not time for everyone to kind of, don't check out on me, because we're going we're gonna to proclaim something together here. And we're going we're gonna to see breakthrough in Jesus' name.